Okay, today is Wednesday, March 21st. We are going over today's solutions. We're going to talk about polarity and why things dissolve, or don't dissolve for that matter. We're going to talk about the three different types of solutions, saturated versus un, uh, sorry, saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated solutions, and I've got a supersaturated solution demo. Uh, homework today is going to be to make sure to read and outline chapter 15.1. Uh, you want to have this done before Friday because Friday starts spring break, and I know nobody wants to do any work over spring break. Uh, the whole basic idea of doing this outline is on Monday before um, before we start uh, school again. I'm sorry, on Sunday night before we start school again. Pull out that outline, look over the notes, um, and look over your outline. Spend no more than 20 minutes, but it should refresh you on what solutions are because we had to break this chapter up into two second sections before and after spring break. All right, basic things that... Um, like I said, we're starting um, uh, we're starting solutions here, so we're going to tell you all the answers to all the chemistry now. All right. Um, uh, the goals for this unit: we want you to be able to describe the properties of the solutions. We also want you guys to be able to identify the different types of solution by state of matter and by particle structure. We're going to get deeper into that. Uh, there are solutions, there are suspensions, and there are colloids. We'll wind up talking about that. The book does also. Um, we want you guys to be able to measure the concentration of solutions in terms of molarity and mass percentage. So there's the math component. Uh, we're not going to do that until after spring break, though. Uh, we want you to differentiate among saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated solutions, which we're going to talk about today. And then tomorrow's goal, uh, tomorrow's, uh, goal is to determine types of solutions and number of grams of solute graphically using solubility curves. It's not as tough as those words make it sound. Right? It's not extremely complicated. Um, but we'll do that tomorrow. Starting out right now, though, uh, if you're not part of the precipitate, you're part of the solution. And you, then a solution is a homogenous mixture. So it's a mixture that's looking the same throughout. Homogenous means looking the same throughout. So you have to have two or more things that look the same throughout. Okay. Uh, examples of solutions, the air around us, Kool-Aid, Carbonated soda and brass are all solutions. Notice there's there's different phases of matter here. We have gases, we have liquids, and we have solids. Solutions are not just liquids. That's a misconception. All right. Um, the words solute and solvent are important here because uh, solutes and solvents are what make solutions up. Solvents are the things that do the dissolving. Solutes are the things that are being dissolved. So dissolvers and dissolvees, okay? The air around us, the solvent, is the nitrogen gas. There's about 75%, if I remember the numbers right, is nitrogen gas. The solute, the thing being dissolved, is the oxygen, the nitrogen, I'm sorry, the, not the nitrogen, nitrogen is dissolving. The oxygen, the carbon dioxide, the water vapor, um, and trace amounts of helium and neon and uh, gases like that. Kool-Aid, the solvent, is the, is the water. And the solute is going to be sugar and the Kool-Aid packets. Carbonated soda has a solvent of the water. And the solute on carbonated soda is going to be things like, oh, caramel color, sugar, flavorings, and the carbonation itself, the carbon dioxide gas. Uh, brass, our solid solution example, is mostly made up of copper, so that's the solvent. And the solute is the zinc, the thing being dissolved in it. Now, in order to make brass, they have to make it molten in order to get it uh, to become a solution, a good solution where it's mixed up completely so that one part of the brass sample is exactly identical to the other part. All right. When we start, start talking about why things dissolve, we need to talk about polarity. So solubility and polarity. It turns out that this three simple three-word sentence explains absolutely everything. Like dissolves like. So things that have charges dissolve things that have charges. Things that don't have charges dissolve things that don't have charges. So you can see here that the two nonpolar pieces of glassware here are not being dissolved by the two polar solutions that are being contained within them. It'd be kind of weird world if we made uh, containers out of polar substances because that would mean that they'd be able to be dissolved by water if we put water in them or other uh, polar substances. Okay. Um, examples here. Uh, vitamin, vitamin C is water-soluble. 
Um, so you can take about as much as you want of it within limits. You can overdose on just about anything, but uh, if you take normal amounts uh, or twice or three times the recommended amount if you're sick, uh, some people recommend that you take extra vitamin C. Your kidneys can take care of this for you because your kidneys can take care of water-soluble stuff. Your kidneys will pull the excess vitamin C out of your uh, bloodstream, put it in your bladder, and you're in luck. You've got an easy way to get rid of polar substances. On the other hand, vitamin A is one that you can overdose on because vitamin A is a nonpolar substance. Uh, it's fat-soluble. Fats are nonpolar. Uh, too much vitamin A uh, will cause you to overdose on it. Uh, you can't take that much vitamin A because of that. Okay. Uh, the two words miscible and immiscible have to do with polarity. Miscible uh, is a substance where, uh, is, uh, where two liquids are completely soluble within each other. This is not an example of a miscible liquid. We've got a uh, homemade uh, salad dressing here. The oil is obviously floating on top of the water here. Immiscible liquids do not mix. So these two are immiscible. The reason for it Oils are not polar, water is polar, they do not dissolve each other. So they're going to be immiscible or not dissolvable. All right. Solubility of ions. Okay, let's show you guys this. This is cool. We know that when we put salt into water, we get salt water. We've talked about before that these ions disassociate from each other. The sodium and the chlorine are separated. So that's no longer sodium chloride, it's sodium ions and chlorine ions. What's happening? At a really macroscopic scale here is the four picture. Here's a salt crystal. You can see what's happening with the water interaction up here. Here's a chlorine ion. It's a negative ion. And we've got the positive portion of the water molecule coming up and attaching to it. That is going to get surrounded. The chlorine ion is going to get surrounded by water molecules, only the positive part of the water molecules, so just the hydrogen sections. And that's going to carry it off. It's going to disassociate it. Okay. You can see down here the positive ion, the uh, positive sodium ion, is getting attacked by the negative portion, the oxygen portion of the water molecule. And it also gets surrounded and carried off, disassociated. Here's a chlorine ion that's in the process of being disassociated here. This is how um, polar water disassociates or dissolves uh, ion, ionic substances. Here's something that's mostly nonpolar. Carbon, 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 hydrogen bonds are all nonpolar. But, oops, the molecule is polar overall because there's one section here. Uh, by the way, this is ethanol. Uh, this, there's this one section here that is polar. We've got a negative end. We've got a positive end. Uh, and uh, basically what's going to wind up happening is when, uh, when water comes in contact with ethanol, the oxygen, the negative end here, is going to get uh, a attractive force to this hydrogen. This is called hydrogen bonding. Okay, notice this is not a real chemical bond. It's not drawn as a stick. It's drawn as three dots here. Uh, that's what hydrogen bonding is drawn as. It's not a real chemical bond, but it is an attractive force between the two. That's why they call it hydrogen. Well, they call it hydrogen bonding because it was first found between hydrogen uh, atoms uh, in water molecules, the hydrogen to oxygen atoms. If you, if you think about it for a moment, this positive portion that is the hydrogen atom is going to link up with another water molecule that's negative up here. And it's going to have its positive portions, its hydrogen portions, hook up with another, another negative portion of another molecule. So water's going to form these long chains that are hydrogen bonded together. If you've ever watched uh, rainwater, raindrops on a window, and you've watched one particular drop go down that window, you notice that it'll pick up other raindrops, other water uh, drops. The reason for that is this hydrogen bonding. Water gets attracted to other water because of this polarity. Okay. Finally, the third situation, we can have nonpolar molecules. This is a nonpolar molecule here. Uh, this is octane. They put it in gas. They put ethanol in gas also. Uh, this uh, molecule here, uh, is nonpolar. There's absolutely nowhere, no negative and no positive section. So water does not interact with it. This means that since it's not going to interact with it, uh, the octane, gasoline, and oil is going to float on top of water. So when you when you look at the asphalt when it rains, you'll actually see that the, uh, all of these uh, nonpolar substances like oil, gasoline, and octane float to the surface. They 
interact with the uh, with the light and cause diffraction of the light, which gives you this nice rainbow effect. It just means that the street is dirty. All right, uh, more examples. Antifreeze is uh, definitely uh, a polar substance, ethylene glycol. Uh, you need to mix it with water, though, before you put it in your car's radiator, because if you put only ethylene glycol in your car's radiator, it's not going to work right. Your car's going to overheat. Uh, so you can mix that up yourself. Some people wonder why I get so upset when people eat, eat in the lab. It turns out that uh, our janitors do a wonderful job of cleaning things up, but they only clean using water. So if you only clean using water, the only chemicals that you're removing are the polar chemicals and the ionic chemicals. You're leaving behind all the non-polar stuff because water can't dissolve it. Um, if you want... Um, if you want to clean up a nonpolar substance, you have to use a nonpolar substance to clean it up with. Uh, acetone is a nonpolar substance, and as most girls know, nail polish remover is made of acetone. Uh, it does a great job of pulling nonpolar stuff apart, like paint, and getting it to dissolve. Uh, but it also causes you to get headaches and smells pretty, pretty nasty, in my opinion. So we don't clean with acetone, so we just don't eat it in the lab. Um, I'm going to skip the elastra because, um, I, because of time. All right, solubility. <laughs> Sorry about the, uh, the slide. It's a little light uh, on this background. But um, we have three types of solutions, and we're almost at the end here. Unsaturated solutions, saturated solutions, and supersaturated solutions. Uh, so unsaturated, saturated, and supersaturated. As you can see, the amount of concentration, so the amount of solute that dissolves, increases as you go to the right. Um, Unsaturated solutions have the ability to dissolve more solutes. They will dissolve more solutes. So um, if you're making up uh, Kool-Aid according to the directions on the package, it's not extremely sweet. So sometimes you can dissolve some more sugar in it, and you can get away with it. You put a little bit more sugar in, you stir it up, and it all dissolves. That's what an unsaturated solution is. If you add more solute and stir it up, it will all wind up dissolving. A saturated solution, on the other hand, no more solute will dissolve. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, when I was a kid and we made Kool-Aid or we made iced tea and mom was out of the kitchen, we got real good at making saturated solutions because we liked it real sweet. So we'd mix it up and add a little bit more sugar and mix it more and add a little bit more sugar and mix it more. And we'd add just the right amount of sugar so that if we added a little bit more sugar, it wouldn't have dissolved. We would have had crystals at the bottom. But we actually did it so that there were no crystals at the bottom, because if there's no crystals at the bottom, mom doesn't ask any questions. <clears throat> Finally, a supersaturated solution, by definition, is holding more solution, more solutes than it's supposed to hold. Um, now, that seems kind of weird. How do you get it to do it? There's a trick. If you raise the temperature of water, it will dissolve more solids. So all you have to do is heat up the water and then dissolve the sugar into it. People who make sweet tea know this because sweet tea is actually a supersaturated solution. It's holding more sugar than it's supposed to be able to hold. Usually supersaturated solutions are pretty unstable. Uh, what I, we mean by this is you can get it to form crystals. Uh, unstable means those, those, uh, that it won't hold all of it and some of it will actually come out of solution if you force it to. Different ways you can get it to force. Uh, you can add crystals to it and that will actually form it's what's called a seed crystal. So this little seed crystal here would fall in, and crystals would form around it. Uh, another way, leaving it sit over time. Honey is a supersaturated solution, and it will naturally over time crystallize. Um, maple syrup is also a supersaturated solution. All right, so there's several supersaturated solutions. There's also another supersaturated solution on the market. We'll talk about it on the next slide here. Actually, I'm going to show you the, the, the demo first. All right, this is a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate. Uh, we're going to throw a strict seed crystal in right about here. And you can see those crystals actually growing right there before your eyes. Um, this is kind of cool. Uh, actually, it's not kind of cool. It's kind of a hot demo. Um, let me explain what I mean by that. Let me back it up, bring it back, pause it. All right, what we have is we have a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate. You have two grams of water and 20 grams of sodium acetate. So barely a spit and practically a quarter cup of sodium acetate. The way we got this to dissolve was we heated it up. 
and it was able to dissolve all of it. Now, what you need to do here, uh, when we throw the uh, crystal in there, think about it this way. The atoms that are making up this liquid are liquid atoms. They're moving rather rapidly. They're shaking quite a bit. When they start crystallizing, though, they form solid crystals. The atoms get close together. They don't vibrate as much. So something has to happen to that energy. This gives off quite a bit of heat. This is what they make reusable hand warmers out of. They put them in plastic, ba in plastic bags. Uh, they've got a little metal disc in them so because you can't put a seed crystal in it because the bags are sealed. Uh, and you snap the metal disc. Uh, it'll form these seed crystals, which you see from here. And also you get heat coming from it. What's nice about this is that it's a rechargeable system. All you need to do is boil some water, put this container in, boil in the boiled water, and that will cause the sodium acetate to turn into to come into solution again. And you can do this reaction over and over and over again, a couple hundred times if you want. So a quick review here about solutions. Unsaturated solutions contain less solutes than can, than can normally be dissolved. Saturated solutions contain the maximum amount of dissolved solutes. So they're going to dissolve as much as can be dissolved. And then finally, supersaturated solutions contain more solutes than you can dissolve at that particular temperature and pressure. Uh, so all of these things are temperature and pressure dependent. All right. Good luck. Don't forget to outline chapter 15.1.